of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you almighty God to you all hearts are open all desires known and from you no secrets are hidden cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify the holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Nehemiah. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate, 
They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read it from he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was standing above all the people and when he opened it all the people stood up that Ezra blessed the Lord the great God and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. The heavens declare the Who 
can tell how often he offends. Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servants from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. A reading from the first letter to the Corinthians. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would make it not any less part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. You have caused to be written your word from our learning. Grant us that hearing our hearts may be inwardly burning. Give to us grace that in your Son we embrace. Thine all his glory joy and all peace in believing. All things were written in truth for our thanks. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been filled in your hearing. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The context of the event we heard about in our Old Testament reading is the mid-5th century BCE when the Israelites who had returned from exile in Babylon were in the process of rebuilding the temple and re-establishing its worship, a tradition which had been completely broken for 70 years and whose history before that seems to have been rather patchy as well. There was an earlier episode during the reign of King Josiah when a rediscovery of the Book of the Law brought about collective repentance and large-scale reform of religious practice. Now, some two centuries later, there is another reading of the law. It was probably not the whole of the Torah which was being read, but part of Leviticus, dealing most closely with the ceremonies of the temple and with the seasonal rituals which the people were commanded to carry out in their own households. The rest of the chapter we heard describes the reestablishment of the festival of Sukkot, which is very much a popular outdoor tradition rather than a temple ritual. It's clear that by this point in their history, not all the people understood Hebrew. The switch to Aramaic, the language Jesus spoke in everyday life, was well underway. So the Levites gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Interestingly, this episode is placed at a period in history when literacy and the recording of chronicles and law in written form was becoming important in many of the cultures of Asia and the Mediterranean. Much of what we think of as the books of Moses took their literary form at this time, although the events they're supposed to describe were many centuries earlier. The idea that the written word has a power and truth stronger than those of oral tradition seems to take hold in many places at about this time. Nehemiah's movement to reform and to purify had a darker side though. His rule is associated with a purge of the priesthood to exclude any in the leadership of the faith who had married into other ethnic groups, either in Babylon or in the area to which they'd now returned, as well as their descendants. The tone of xenophobia is very strong in the final chapters of the book of Nehemiah, but it was not unopposed in scripture. The book of Ruth is thought to have been written at least in part to show the people that even King David had a Moabite grandmother and that ethnic origin is irrelevant to the purposes of God. By the time of Jesus, 
there were differing views about the validity of the various categories of scripture within Judaism. The Sadducees, who made up the most powerful faction in the leadership of the temple, believed that only the Torah, the five books of Moses, were to be regarded as authoritative. But other religious groups also recognized the writings of the prophets and the wisdom literature as divinely inspired. When Jesus gets up to read in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, for example, it is the scroll of Isaiah which is handed to him. Like Nehemiah, this part of Isaiah is thought to date from the period after the return from Babylon, but it represents a very different genre and a very different attitude. What Jesus reads is, slightly paraphrased, the beginning of Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But he breaks off abruptly in the middle of the verse, rolls up the scroll, hands it back to the attendant and sits down. Because this passage is poetic, this break would have been obvious to his hearers who were probably very familiar with the passage anyway. It's as if we had sung in our gradual hymn, hark the glad sound, the savior comes, the savior promised long, let every heart prepare a throne, and then stopped. It's no wonder the eyes of everyone in the synagogue are fixed on Jesus. The verse he's interrupted goes on, and the day of vengeance of our God. And leaving it out is tantamount to saying that this is not a part of his teaching. Divine vengeance is not a part of the gospel. When Jesus tells his hearers, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, the omission is part of that fulfillment. We'll hear next week that the people initially respond well, then skeptically and selfishly. And when Jesus reminds them of the times when God showed favor and mercy to foreigners rather than Israelites, they rise up against him with violence. The omission is part of the fulfillment. This is a challenge to the attitude which we can see starting to take shape in Nehemiah and which has persisted into our own day, that the written word of scripture is something fixed and unchangeable, that our way of hearing the message of God cannot be permitted to change with new circumstances and the development of new and fuller understandings. It's an attitude which develops, I think, in situations of stress and trauma and crisis, when communities tend to close ranks, to become suspicious of outsiders, and to cling to fossilized and illusory recollections of a past when everything was better. From that standpoint, the structures and patterns which belong to that past seem like a magical formula even if many of them are founded in fear and blame of the other. We see this tendency today in nationalist movements, in social conservatism, and in the kind of Christianity which clings to a literal reading of scripture. The historical time of Jesus was unquestionably one of anxiety and trauma as well, but his incarnation redeems and transforms disrupting the structures of the past. His teaching ministry consistently points away from the old patterns and the strategic omission in the synagogue at Nazareth is a marker for this new path, a sign that not all the teachings of the past are to be carried forward into the kingdom of God. God's mercy and favor are central to the gospel but vengeance, hatred, and exclusion are not. And a living faith is one which re-examines and questions itself in the light of all God's revelations, social, scientific, 
political, theological. Jesus lives, teaches, heals, dies, and rises again for everyone, offering himself in the fullness of divine love so that all the world might be saved, both the body of Christ, whose diversity Paul described so eloquently in his letter to the Corinthians, and which we celebrate in this week of prayer for Christian unity, and all the beloved creation of God. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our faith as we say. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under conscious Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Sees the glory of a star that pierced the night. As we tell the wondrous story, we are bathed in radiant light. Stars sent forth from highest heaven, dancing light of God's design. Shine upon the gifts that's given. Now for in time. Once again may we discover the word made flesh sent from above in our neighbor, sister, brother, in the lonely and unloved. May we touch him, may we hold him, may we cradle For just as the body is one and has many members, 
and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. Let us pray as that one body for our church, for our baptismal ministries, and for the Christian stewardship by which we use the resources God gives us to fulfill Christ's purpose for the world. Let us respond to Christ's call to us through the prophet Isaiah saying, Lord, here I am. Lord Jesus Christ, through your body, the church, keep us in the purpose you revealed at the beginning of your ministry. We pray for the leaders of our church, for Linda, Anne, Andrew, and Kevin, our bishops, for Andrea, our priest, and Carol, our deacon, for Archbishop Mark MacDonald and other indigenous Anglican leaders. In our circle of prayer, we pray for Stephen, Saran, Shafira, Christian, and Caden, Alan and Diane, and Shirley. We pray for the users of this space, the 18th Willowdale Scout Group, and for other users as they discern their plans for the future. We pray for the refugee families that we are helping to support through the Don Valley Refugee Resettlers. For our companion diocese of Grahamstown, South Africa, and for the Anglican Church in Hong Kong. Teach us to live together that we, as one body, might truly say, Lord, here I am. Lord Jesus Christ, reveal your presence in those persons we seek to serve in your name. We bring before you those who have requested our prayers and whose names are written with intent in the bulletin. We hold before you those who are shut in. Bob, Elsie, Gloria, Jean, Louise, and Sylvia, and the residents of Sunrise of Thornhill. May we, as one body, meet their needs, saying, Lord, here I am. Lord Jesus Christ, who redeemed us, teach us to pray in the world today for all who are searching for comfort and refuge amid loss. Be with us as one body, we strive for justice and peace among all people. We pray for the people of Afghanistan, Ethiopia and Tigray, Sudan, Haiti, Myanmar, Yemen, and all places experiencing war and civil unrest. We pray for the people of Tonga as they cope with the devastating aftermath of volcanic eruption and tsunami. And for those in Ghana as they recover from explosion. We pray especially today for the asylum seeker family who froze to death in Manitoba. We pray for those with the coronavirus, those who care for them, those who are suffering from anxiety during this stressful time, for researchers investigating the most recent variants, and for those who struggle with vaccine hesitancy, praying especially for those who live alone those in isolation, and those who have cried out for our help. Work through us as one body, that the poor may be blessed, the homeless housed, the weeping comforted, that we might truly say, Lord, here I am. Before you, Lord Jesus Christ, we remember those departed whose names we now speak or remember. Open our hearts to grace and truth, 
fill us with your holy and life-giving grace that we may comfort all who mourn, saying, Lord, here I am. Holy God, send us into the world to work that purpose revealed in Christ your Son, in his name. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to the table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.
as we leave this virtual service. May you leave with peace in your hearts to go forth and to love and serve our ever present, ever loving Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.